Welcome everyone to the August 2019 community meeting of the I2B2 Transmark Foundation. My name is Rudy Ponzone and I will be the host for today's meeting. You can see here our agenda for today. We have a couple of topics that we'll go through um, and um, we'll have a presentation then uh, as a, at the end on the new Shrine Web Client project. <clears throat> So let's get started. Uh, those of you who are members of the foundation, and there are, I think, 96 right now, should have gotten an email from us. We're having uh, uh, our, our election, our annual election for uh, membership. Uh, currently, as I said, there are about 96 members. Uh, the member activities, one of the, the main activity so far has been uh, creating of the working groups and we've got four active working groups today uh, and about 140 people across the community are participating actively in these working groups there's a lot of uh, interest a lot of interesting things happening in them and if you uh, are interested you can certainly um, join these are all open you don't have to be a member to join a working group uh, but uh, and each of them have uh, their own uh, web page or uh, uh, Google Drive um, where they're holding their information and minutes of their meetings. And I encourage you, if, you, if these are interesting topics for you, uh, if you go to the website, you can find out more about them and uh, think, consider joining. Uh, also, if you have an idea of other uh, working groups, uh, we'd certainly be delighted to, to have some more uh, if there's interest. So the, the member, um, membership uh, is open to anyone um, you need to be nominated by a member an existing member uh, and then there, there's an election for the members uh, once all the nominations are in uh, the nominations are open as i said if you are a member you should have received already an email uh, inviting you to nominate uh, new members to the to the foundation um, we're, we, we, what we're looking for is people who are actively using our platforms or interested in our platforms, uh, doing things uh, with the community uh, who would be, uh, you know, willing to participate in various things, various activities. Uh, and it's a, a good time to, to really try to get, you know, maybe some new people involved uh, with the different programs that we have. Um, <clears throat> we're also trying to kind of revitalize the, the membership program again uh, we, when, when it was set up, we, there was not a, a, a thought about having someone who actually would lead the membership program. And so we're, we're looking for one or two people who might want to chair or co-chair uh, the overall support uh, for the program and uh, help, you know, get things like uh, member meetings going. Uh, really vision that the, member, the membership should really be much more involved not only in the user groups, but also planning our, our annual meetings uh, that we have. And so we're really trying to get uh, get things rolling again. So the nominations are open today. Um, they're also will be open through September 5th. Uh, again, if you're a member, you should have gotten the links for how you nominate people. Uh, if you're not a member, you know, you can see the list of members on the, the website and, uh, you know, maybe express your interest to, to one of us and maybe get uh, nominated. Uh, every member can nominate up to two new members. Um, and uh, again, all the instructions are in the email that you got. So if for some reason uh, you haven't received it, please let one of us know uh, and we'll get that fixed right away. Okay. Next topic, I'd like to just talk quickly about the Tubingen meeting. Uh, we're having our, our fall symposium uh, at the University of Tubingen. Uh, in Germany, uh, it's a very small town with a lot of history. Uh, it's the place where DNA was first isolated in 1868, uh, and also where uh, Aloysius Alzheimer started his uh, initial work on uh, Alzheimer's, the, what became Alzheimer's degree disease, but also quite a few others uh, have, have worked at the university. Um, and so we've been uh, pulling together a, uh, a program uh, for us, uh, the organizing committee from the you know, in the local area uh, involves uh, uh, Oliver, uh, Hans Ulrich, and, and uh, Ulrich Sachs, and uh, we've been working closely with them and our events working group to try to pull together a, a nice agenda for us there. 
it's on October 8th and 9th. Um, and um, again, we're, we're, we've been working to, to pull it together. We've got a number of, uh, I think close to 30 people already registered for it, but a lot of, a lot of openings still. Uh, our speaker program is largely filled now, uh, but their poster session is wide open. And so if you're thinking about coming or planning to come, please um, please think about pre presenting a poster. We'd love to have it. Um, the other thing I want to mention is that hotel space it is a small town and the hotel space is limited. Um, we've arranged for a number of discounted rooms that are available. Uh, and you can see the, uh, the details on the logistics page. But if you're interested in coming, uh, please um, please book soon because uh, we, we're, we're concerned that, you know, the series are gonna uh, fill up pretty quickly. So uh, just to give you a quick, you know, preview of some of the presentations that we have uh, lined up. Um, a number of um, uh, projects are, are talking about the use cases. Um, Oliver, one of our, our who's leading the local organizing group, will uh, talk, you know, tell us a little bit more about the university. Um, a number of uh, uh, large projects are, are underway or just getting rolling, uh, and we'll hear, you know, about some of them, uh, as us, as well as uh, updates as usual on, you know, I2B2 and Transmart and I2B2 Transmart. So we're we're looking at uh, forward to a really interesting meeting. Uh, we will. Uh, have some social activities also, uh, a dinner and a tour of Tübingen uh, as part of it. And uh, again, we encourage you to, to visit the website, look at the agenda and see if it uh, if it's into your plans. It's October 8th and 9th. Okay, so now I'm gonna invite Mike Mendez to, to uh, present uh, to talk a little bit about beta testing of I2B21.7.12. Mike, I'm gonna mute you here. Unmute you, sorry. There you are. Okay, Mike, maybe you have to unmute yourself. You should be able to talk now. Hello, can, okay, you, hear, Mike? can you hear me now? Yeah. Yes, yes, that's fine. Okay, uh, great. So, hold on. Uh, okay, so I want to talk a little bit of Beta 1. So, Beta 1 came out on August 1st, and at that time, we released three different platforms for it. One was the standardized, uh, uh, standardized uh, source code repository where you could basically just uh, build it the standard way. We also released it in a VMware, which had everything with the web client and uh, the server side configured. And then we also released it in the new format, which is a war file. And so going forward, this is how the distribution is going to be done is we're going to be providing a war file. And so basically you just drop the war file in and uh, it should just upgrade to the latest version. You might have to do some database configurations if those are needed. Or, uh, and in the past, we've had configuration files, whether they were XML or property files. This is, these have all been eliminated and turned into a, a database entry. So, so for beta one, that's, we had the new install. We also had some enhancements to the web client. And then the other uh, big aspect is we added the whole ACT ontology to it. So now that um, you can install the ACT ontology just as you installed the ITB2 demo data. Uh, you just change uh, one entry in the property file from de a demo to ACT, and then you just do your standard install and it will load it right into your database. Um, the other aspect is we added NTLM2 to our uh, beta one. So this uh, allows for the latest in uh, the Microsoft uh, NT authentication. It also does a little bit of uh, NT, NT3, but it's uh, not fully implemented, so I didn't want to put that in there. But in the future, uh, we'll be providing NT LM3. Um, the other thing is we enhanced our total num count. So we used uh, some of the software developed by the Pocori project for the total num. So we have the SQL Server and the Postgres. 
so we just uh, use those and then implement it also in the implementation. And now you can run total num scripts uh, straight from the ICP to just uh, sort to see this. Uh, anyone who has Postgres, we'd be really interested in you trying out the Postgres and giving any enhancements or modifications that would be needed to improve the performance of that. Okay, yeah, can you switch to the next page, Rudy? Thanks. Yep, there you go. Okay. So, well, so right now I'm actually out uh, on vacation. So when I come back, uh, beginning, of next, beginning of this week, uh, so on Monday, we're going to finish up on a beta uh, one, uh, and then we're going to have a conference call. And so we're going to talk about the, uh, the positive, negatives, how it went, any enhancements, whether things make sense. And some of that stuff was going to be rolled into beta two. But as far as beta two, uh, we're going to include Oxus report also. So we're going to have the new authentication for NCLM2 and then Oxus support. And then we're also going to be in integrating a red cap implementation. And so the red cap implementation is it will allow you to take and so if someone fills out a form on the red cap uh, website on the web cap, uh, web interface, whatever they implement or whatever they enter in will be loaded directly into ITB2. And then any of the um, uh, the form questions will be created as uh, ontology entries. And so if it's a fleet uh, free tech uh, form that they can fill out, that whole form will be inserted into the blob. And then uh, if there's like a date, it will be part of a date, uh, like a start date. And if it's a numeric value, you'll be able to do uh, a, it will come up with your standardized ICD2 pop-up that will say, uh, enter in a numeric value greater than less than, et cetera. Okay, can, yeah, can you switch to the next page? Got it, okay. Okay, so yeah, so we had a good uh, presentation for the first call, and then we had a, a follow-up call. So like I said, we're going to have another call on August 28th at noon uh, Eastern time. So anyone who wants to participate, I've included the, uh, the call information. We'd love to have you join, you, uh, whether it's looking at documentation, whether it's looking at source code, or whether it's just doing just a smoke test of it to see if it makes sense. Any type of testing, any type of eye looking at it will be wonderful. Uh, so we'd greatly appreciate any type of, whatever expertise you can bring to the table will be greatly appreciated. Um, so I think, that, I think that's it for my stuff, Rudy. Unless you think of anything else I should say that I didn't. No, I, I, don't, I don't have anything. Um... I don't see any questions. If anyone has any questions, you can raise your hand or put them in the chat window right now for Mike. Thanks for interrupting uh, yeah, your vacation I, for uh, joining us here. <laughs> yeah, so if you have any questions, bring it up right now because I'm probably not going to be on the rest of the call because it's really loud here at Universal in Florida. <laughs> so, <laughs> so it's crazy here. But anyway, are there any questions already? No, I don't see any. Okay, that's good. No. All right, thanks. Okay, great. Thanks, Mike. Yep, thanks. Appreciate I hope it. to see more people on uh, so on the uh, August 20th call. Okay, thanks everyone. Bye. Thanks, Mike. Okay, I think that's our first presentation from Universal Studios actually. Um, now let me uh, I just want to talk briefly about Transmart version 19. Um, we've been working on this for the last couple of months uh, and uh, I know we've presented here. I think Peter Rice has presented uh, a lot more detail about the release itself. Um, just a quick overview. Uh, it, uh, it has involved a lot of changes to the to the architecture and, and a lot of the um, the core pieces uh, of the the program. Uh, a lot of reorganization of the GitHub. Uh, quite a few code cleanup um, activities. These are things that were done as part of the Paul VX lab and the work they've been doing with I2B2 Transmart. That's included some things that uh, I believe the Hive did for uh, one of the front of the Transmart Pro project uh, and also um, trying to move us uh, along on the Java uh, version. So we're now at Grails 2.5.4 and Java 8 uh, and we're getting ready to get to move the next version up to Java 11 uh, so that we can stay compliant with 
their releases um, uh, on the Java platform. Um, the database schema for merging, you know, becoming having uh, the same database as I2B2 makes a, a big leap ahead here. And so we're, we're going to be mostly in sync with the I2B2 uh, data, data model with this release. Uh, there's integration with the picture API, which is part of the I2B2 Transmart platform, uh, and uh, a, a number of cleanups in the ETL um, uh, for loading data into the system. Uh, and Um, doing at that point. Uh, this has been a huge amount of work by uh, Peter Rice and, um, uh, you know, finally, um, you know, getting all this pulled together has been a great accomplishment. Uh, and I'm happy to announce that this will be available starting tomorrow for, uh, for testing. So we've completed the internal tests and uh, we have a working version just about ready to, to launch and it'll be available starting tomorrow. Um, we encourage anybody, uh, certainly any of our Transmart users out there, um, this would be, it would be great over the next uh, couple of weeks if you could just get on here. Uh, there will be some test data available. Uh, if you could give it, um, give it a walkthrough and please send us back anything that you see that doesn't look right or uh, have any issues with. But um, we're, we're excited. Um, this, uh, this version 19 includes everything that was in version 16.3. Is um, I think this is just a Postgres version, but there's also an Oracle version. Uh, and um, this will will all be uh, hopefully made available within uh, about a month or two once we finish and can complete uh, the, the testing. If anybody has any questions, I'd be happy to answer them quickly now. Uh, otherwise, as I say, there'll be time at the end. And again, I don't see any questions. Maybe there is one question. Um, Mark Bacon. Mark, I think I've unmuted you. Would you like to ask your question? Mark, can you hear me? I hear you, Mark. Oh, you can hear <laughs> I can me. hear you. Okay, yes. uh, great. Sorry, I was looking on my uh, computer for the <laughs> chat button. Yeah, yeah. I'm sure the audio no, is um, Yep. Uh, Fractalis, was that supposed to be in, um, uh, I think that was supposed to be coming up in 19. Did, did, was that integrated at all? Um, I think we're, we're still working on that part. Um, I don't know if... Uh, that was one of the last bits that we're doing. We're, we're trying to get to the beta testing for the, a lot of the core pieces. Uh, if Peter, I don't know if Peter can give us a quick update. I see he's on the line. Hi, Peter, yeah. we're, we're, really we're, working yeah. we're, we're working on the fractalis bit and we're testing the, the core bits first, but the idea is to have the, the advanced workflows and smart R and fractalis available for analysis. Right. Great. Um, sorry, yeah. And the other big issue we, we for us was the longitudinal data. I think there was some talk of that coming in in version 19 as well. Is there any, any update on that? There was a working group looking into that. This is merging with what was done with Transmart 17. But there was a working group looking into that and how to fix the data models up with ITB2, but there's, there's no result from that yet. Right. Okay. Thanks. Uh, but if you have use cases for that, we'd be interested in adding them to the, the requirements that will help to um, direct the work. The, I mean, we do have a, a need for, for longitudinal data uh, in terms of multiple samples and multiple sample types sure. for, for each patient. OK, so thanks. Okay. Or maybe we can um, talk. It might be interesting, actually, to chat offline, Mark. So. Okay. Try to get something set up. Because uh, I, under I understood that was an issue with 16.3, is that the, there is an issue with the, um, uh, I don't know if it, if it was 
uh, really with Transmart or, or TM Data Loader, but, we, but I, I could only um, load uh, unique patients. So patients with multiple samples, it was rejecting. Yeah, I think maybe something we could take offline. Um, I, I know that um, the Clarivate guys are working on TM Data Loader to have a you know that a version and and that it will be included in the release as well so but mark we if we could i, I will we'll get in contact with you okay great thank you okay thanks okay thanks peter yeah i think the issue is is the Anything data else? you can load per sample you can load high dimensional data yep in various ways but it's it's ah. how to load the rest of the data for the samples i think is the problem yeah. Okay. Anything else you want to add, Peter? In general, for nineteen. Um, well, also we've we've now got the wiki and uh, all the other sites up, so we'll be populating that with more information for the uh, the beta testing. Yeah. Okay. Great. Yeah. Anyone who was. Um, trying to, to get to our wiki site and, and a number of our um, um, informational pieces, not on the, not the website itself, but some of the, the different confluence pages and um, uh, pieces are, have been down for a couple of weeks, unfortunately, and had some issues with our uh, SSL clients. Anyway, that's all solved and these are generally available again. So I apologize for that. Okay, well, now um, we, I would be delighted to invite uh, a guest, another guest speaker, uh, Anna Palma Maram from the Harvard Catalyst is gonna talk about uh, trying 2020. Anna Palma, you ready? Yep, thank you. So thank you again for inviting me to your call today. I'm really excited to share about um, what we've been doing for Shrine 2020. Um, can you go to the next slide, please, Rudy? Okay. All right, so I wanted to first set the stage for this conversation and briefly discuss the interactions between um, these different platforms. So the ACT Network um, is a nationwide federation of research institutions, and it's allowing sites that are part of this network to share aggregate patient counts from EHR data. So this initiative is funded by the NIH through the NCATS and the CTSA program. And the infrastructure for ACT consists of two key pieces. So you have your local um, I2B2 EHR data repositories, and they're linked by the Shrine platform, which stands for the Shared Health Research um, Information Network. So if you're a researcher um, and you're looking for patients at your own institutions, you would log into your I2B2 instance. Um, but if you wanted access to patient sets um, across the country with regional diversity, you would then log into the ACT network. Um, so ACT and Shrine are kind of synonymous in this context. So the Shrine platform itself consists of three separate applications, one of which is a web-based query tool, and very similar to I2B2, it allows researchers to construct uh, complex Boolean queries, um, and the goal is to obtain real-time aggregate counts of patients at the participating network of that, uh, participating institutions of that network. And right now, the Shrine UI is based on the existing I2B2 web client. Um, the ACT network is expanding. Right now we have about 41 um, sites, but the plan is to expand to 60 CTSA sites. Um, they're over data for 1.25 million patients, and we're also expanding um, the research user base. So really the goal for this new user interface um, is to create um, the Shrine user experience to be as intuitive as possible while also conveying those complex query constructions and also um, trying to reduce the, the need for extensive training. Um, and I just want to point out that this is just for the Shrine web client, is not a replacement for I2B2. We have shared a lot of the analysis we've done um, with the community. So most recently we shared some of the findings um, with the user interface working group. So it's been really great to sort of share the lessons learned and the best practices to implement some of these features. Um, next slide, please. So 
So the new UI, we've dubbed it Shrine 2020. So this is because we're anticipating a release of this tool before the end of next year. Um, so we're focusing on the same use case, cohort discovery and study feasibility. And um, we're focusing on novice users and we're defining this user base as um, researchers who are not familiar with querying EHR data, and they may not be familiar with the traditional I2B2 UI. Um, so they might, yeah. And then um, we also wanna make sure our users, they do understand logic construction, logic and logic construction. So they understand how to use ands and ors and parentheses to convey ordering and groups. Um, and we also made the assumption that they understand the purpose of Shrine and the purpose of ACT and what that what logging into the tool will help them achieve. We're also being mindful to select functionality that is most valuable to a novice user. So we just have about a year um, to build the new UI. So we're making some hard decisions about what features are key to support novice users for this first phase while also keeping it simple, intuitive, um, but making sure they can take full capabilities of the software. Next slide, please. Um, so what we've done so far, so we have sort of three buckets of the type of analysis work we've done so far. So the first blue bucket on the very left is um, our internal analysis. So really trying to figure out where to start, what is sort of um, the complete uh, feature set we should be looking. Um, the second bucket, which is in purple, is the landscape analysis. Um, so we looked at open source informatics tool that provide similar functionalities, but their UIs have different design philosophies and goals. Um, and the green bucket is sort of um, our iterative, iterative focus group feedback. So we came up um, with two main design concepts, and then we wanted to test them and um, get feedback on them to verify we're building the right tool and solving the right problem. Um, on, all along this process, um, we have Griffin Weber, Diane Kyo, Doug McFadden, and the rest of the Shrine leadership team um, that's really key to this process. Next slide, please. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about the clinicaltrials.gov analysis. Um, so we're starting with uh, 20 trials, and we're going to expand to 100. Um, and so the goal of ACT is accrual to clinical trials, and we thought we should be looking at the types of inclusion and exclusion criteria that's currently out there and seeing how those um, published um, criteria matches up to how you can construct a query in Shrine. Um, so we're not just looking at number of criteria that involves diagnosis codes, procedure codes, labs, or medications. We're also looking at how we can expand the data sets in the future. Um, so we've noticed a lot of questions related to health surveys, questionnaires, referencing other codes such as the DSM. Um, we're looking at an average, how many groups are needed to fully convey um, the eligibility criteria how many terms are within a group, how many totals, to, um, how many uh, terms or concepts are used for the entire um, criteria. And we're also looking at how often features like multiple occurrences, date range, and event-based queries are used in defining um, the inclusion and exclusion criteria on clinicaltrials.gov. Um, so I do have some preliminary data to share on just the 20, um, studies we looked at. So um, of the 20, about 18 of them required a specific eight range. Only three of them specified gender. Um, 19 of them, so almost all of them, um, required a diagnosis code. Half of them required either a pres uh, prescription or a procedure. Um, seven of them um, required entry of a lab value, and eight of them required specifying a specific date range for those events. And so um, we'll be happy to, as we go on, I'm sure we'll be talking more about um, this type of analysis. Uh, next slide, please. So our landscape analysis. So like I mentioned, we looked at other open source platforms. Um, so we looked at I2B2, Glowing Bear, which is from the Hive, um, Picture UI, and then Leaf, which is from the University of Washington. So these different user, experience, um, user interfaces were developed for 
query, exploration, and analysis of large clinic and genomic databases, but each of them took a very different approach based on the expertise level of their target audience or the special characteristics of their underlying data. Um, next slide, please. So the top left, we have Glowing Bear. So Glowing Bear was originally created for Transmart, um, which is based on um, the I2B2 data model, but it's geared more towards translational research studies. Um, it doesn't have a lot of the same query building features of I2B2, but it makes the UI simpler and easier for new users to learn. Um, the query construction, which is what I'll be focusing um, on for this segment, um, is built from the top to bottom. It has a drag and drop features and users can go ahead and refine their search based on selecting the values below. Right underneath it, I have a screenshot of the um, query interface for LEAF. So LEAF was inspired by I2B2, so you can see the layout of the three different panels. Um, but they differ because they build their um, the vertical layout for temporal queries. Um, they also have a drag and drop, but they have an easier way to modify um, or edit modifiers within the query. So if you quick click the options button there, you can modify whether it's a primary um, diagnosis. And they also have um, filters um, to help set numeric values. I should also point out LEAF does include a direct to REDCap export feature. And on the most right, right hand side, we have the picture UI. So this is the most minimalistic we've seen. It's a very clean and simple interface with a Google like search. So instead of a drag and drop, the you would enter your search criteria. It has a horizontal orientation of the code categories, and then you can drill down to select the most appropriate code set or concept, sorry. Um, next slide, please. So we met um, with each of these stakeholders um, and internally, and we iterated on the design based on our use case, um, based on the core functionality we wanted to support for this first phase, and also really keeping in mind who is this novice user. Um, so we came up, we ended up with two concepts, and this we presented at the June I2B2 conference in the form of a focused um, of a focus group session. And we really, so we selected a study from clinicaltrials.gov and we asked the participants um, as a novice user, evaluate these two different concepts um, and we asked them to fill out a simple survey. Um, so you go to the next slide, please. I'll just um, briefly show the two concepts we displayed. So our first concept, um, you can see it has a top to down query uh, construction. There's a lot of embedded instructional help text. We also use helper phrases um, to help construct a sentence with the type of uh, query they're trying to build. And we avoid using query logic text. Um, and we also wanted to display all the options to the user. We didn't want to hide any of the features. Um, so the multiple occurrences and the date range are always visible on the page. And the next concept, which is on the next slide, Um, it's, it's a very minimalistic approach. So we've hidden a lot of the features, um, but we wanted to make sure you can find them in a discoverable manner. Um, and this um, assumed a type ahead instead of a drag and drop. So there are a lot of common commonalities between these two um, concepts. They use colors to specify the inclusion and exclusion criteria. And we use these words in front of the code um, to help the user understand the code category. So we, if it was a medication, you would have prescribed. If it was a diagnosis code, you would display diagnosis. If it was a lab, um, you would say laboratory test. This is an older um, wireframe. So after the conference, if you can go to the next slide, please. Um, we iterated on another, um, another design phase of going through um, wireframes and we actually came out with the most current um, query constructor which we're actually um, in the process of building out. If you can go to the next slide please. So based off the feedback from the surveys and from the conference, um, this is the layout that we are currently working on. So we've divided up the page into a three panel layout. 
Um, and I, again, will just be focusing on the, on the query construction view. So um, we have a three, um, it's a drag and drop feature. So you'd search for your code set on the left and drag the concepts to the right. Um, again, if you can go to the next slide. So this is how it looks when you're first there, and this is how the page might look like once you've constructed your um, query. And we've taken sort of the best of both concepts, the two concepts I presented previously. So again, it's a top to down construction. Um, there's clear use of colors to convey the inclusion and exclusion criteria. Um, we use our helper sentence, so it can, um, creates a sentence for the users. Um, we use radio buttons so the user can clearly select whether it's an inclusion or exclusion criteria. And again, we kept, um, we wanted to make sure we're appending the code category so it's, the user can easily understand where this um, code is from. Um, and we also wanted to make um, the features discoverable. So um, if you can go to the next slide, please. Um, you can set options. So again, there's instructional text that um, tells you what you can set the options for. So you can set your date range here and your multiple concept occurrences here. And once you select them, um, the values get rolled up here so you can clearly read um, what you previously selected. And then you also are able, when you click um, an I um, these icons, um, you can remove a term and you can also view additional information about that concept. So here, this is just a view of the folder that was selected. So it include the path to that folder and also the um, concepts that are embedded within that folder. Uh, and Palma, I, uh, we did get a question with an interesting question. Um, since you're using color so much, Mm -hmm. What about, do you have alternate color for colorblind users? Is this something so, you thought about? Yeah, if you go back to the previous slide. Um, so we were trying to be really clear about the words and the radio buttons we're using. So it's find patients with, find patients without. So we're hoping those words um, and help text would help can have an alternate meaning, meaning um, with an addition to the coloring scheme. Okay. All right, thank you. And if you can go to the next slide, please. So what the process I just discussed was focusing on just the query construction. Um, so now our next uh, step is to reiterate on that process, but focusing on um, the search. So we are actively working on the requirements and the features for the search. Um, at the beginning of the month, we we held uh, another focus group session reviewing the um, search, and we're still parsing through the survey results, and we're trying to figure out and iterate on the feature and designs for that. But what I will share with you is sort of the two types of um, search for these two tools. So for Glowing Bear and for Leap, um, I'm sorry, I forgot to remove picture UI from this. Um, I just wanted to talk briefly about their um, their search capabilities or how they display their search. Oops. So here I have um, a screenshot of how Glowing Bear um, displays their search. Um, so in this particular example, I searched for type two diabetes. Um, and you can see how in Glowing Bear, what they do is they expand the entire ontology. Um, so it displays all of the folders that are underneath this specific um, code category. And it highlights the terms that match your, or ma highlights the concepts that match your search criteria. So here, um, the disorder of eye with type two diabetes, and you can see all the relevant um, siblings that match that um, search term in context of where they are in the ontology. So it's helping to see the sibling relations of the matching concepts. Um, and in the next example, if you can go to the next slide, please. Um, so this is an example of how LEAP does their search. So at the very top, I've searched for diabetes type mellitus. Um, and you'll see how the search term below, um, or the concepts are displayed below. 
Um, so it's similar in the sense of um, Glowing Bear, but what this is doing is condensing um, the path. So it's collapsing all the extraneous folders and only focusing on the relative path to that matching concept. So we looked at these two tools. We've um, ran a user, like I mentioned, a user session a couple weeks ago, and we're sort of going through some of the feedback we got. We're going through the tech feasibility of what it means to implement some of these features. So our next phase, um, and if you can go to the next slide, please, um, is to iterate again, like I said, on the requirements and the feedback for the search itself. Um, and again, throughout this process, we are actively trying reaching out to novice users to sort of get their feedback. So a lot of the focus group we've done has been to members of the I2B2 community, um, but we're also asking for your help um, to help us identify any novice users, new researchers, and sort of um, get their feedback on the tool. That's all I had for today. Um, I see there's a lot of questions in the there's chat. A couple questions, yeah. <laughs> uh, so one of them is, can other ontologies be used? Um, Besides yeah, I, so we're building this, um, focusing just on the ACT ontology. Um, but yes, from my understanding, I, I, I think you should be able to use other um, ontologies with this new interface. Okay. How about OMOP? Um, you be doing any support with for OMOP? I'm not sure if that's in our roadmap for right now. Again, we our goal is to build this specifically for um, for the ACT um, network. So I think right now ACT is um, supporting. I think I2B2. Um, but I can actually, I'll, I'll, I can come back to that question because I'm really not sure. But I just, I'm. Okay, sure. Yep. Okay, are there any other questions? Again, you can put a question in the chat window. Um, raise your hand, I'll try to get you unmuted. or put a question in the question window. Um, one of the comments on uh, OMOP is that uh, a number of program or under projects are using OMOP as their standard. Um, mm -hmm. And so it, it just might be, I think it might be something to worth considering for you guys. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you for that. It's the comment from the Keith Elliston. Thank you. Any other questions? Not seeing anything else. Okay. Well, thank you very much. That was very, very good introduction and um, good luck with the project. Thank you. Hopefully anyone interested will, uh, will come back and reach out to you. Okay, um, are there any questions about anything else that we covered here today? I seem to have lost my question window. If you have a question, if you could put it in the chat window, that would be helpful. Or raise your hand. Ah, here it is, sorry. Uh, Griffin, now ACT does plan to include a few OMOP sites. Griffin has just responded. Um, Griffin, I can unmute you. You have any, would you like to add anything else? Let's see. Griffin, now uh, you're unmuted. Yeah, so just to follow up on that, the, um, the ACT network is 
um, in uh, upcoming wave, we'll be including a few OMOP sides. The user interface that Anapama demoed is just for the front end of the software. There's a whole kind of back end component of Shrine that actually does the queries. So what, the front end part is independent of what the back end query tool is or what ontology is put into the um, in the network. Okay. Thank you. We then also have a, a question about what's the up what's the upgrade path for I two B two with these new releases that are coming. Um, Jeff, I see you're on. I don't know if you're able to talk, but. Um, Yeah, sorry, Bo, for, uh, I don't think we have an answer to that. Um, then there's your documentation on the upgrade path. I believe that will be, that has is being discussed in this part of the release plan. I don't, I don't have myself any details about that. Yeah, the question is, you know, if uh, if you're on an, an earlier version like one dot, he's at uh, on 1.7.04, and then what's the upgrade path now to, to 12, for example? <clears throat> okay, well, we'll um. I will pass that along to the team and, and um, Bo will try to get back to you. Anyone else have any questions? Okay, well, I want to thank everyone for participating today. Uh, and uh, think about uh, if you have any opportunity to come to Tabingen in October, we'd love to have you there. Uh, if you're a member, please uh, check your email and uh, make your nominations and then participate in the election uh, the first week in September. You'll be getting more information on how to actually participate in the election. And we'll, uh, we'll talk to everyone again next month. Thanks, everyone.